position need not be true, so far as concerns the way in which it implicates the logical subjects with the predicate. For the primary physical feeling of that nexus by the prehending subject may have involved according to categorical condition B. In this case, the proposition objects the physical enjoyment of a nexus with the definition of its predicate, whereas that predicate may have only been enjoyed conceptually by these logical subjects. Thus, what the proposition proposes is a physical fact in the nexus, was in truth only a mental fact. Unless it is understood for what it is, error arises. Such understanding belongs to the subjective form. But if the primary physical feeling involves no reversion in any stage, then the predicate of the proposition is that eternal object which constitutes the definiteness of that nexus. In this case, the proposition is, without qualification, true. The authentic perceptive feeling will then be termed, direct. Thus there are, indirect, perceptive feelings when, reversion, is involved and, direct, perceptive feelings, and feelings of both these species are termed, authentic. In the case of these, authentic, feelings, the predicate has realization in the nexus, physically or ideally, apart from any reference to the prehending subject. T thirdly, and lastly, the predicative feeling may have arisen in the prehending subject by reversion, according to the heading S of the previous propositions and feelings. 263. Section. In this case the predicate has in it some elements which really contribute to the definiteness of the nexus, but it has also some elements which contrast with corresponding elements in the nexus. These latter elements have been introduced in the concrescence of the prehending subject. The predicate is thus distorted from the truth by the subjectivity of the prehending subject. Such a perceptive feeling will be termed, unauthentic. Unauthentic feelings are feelings derived from a tie, imagination, in the sense that there is only one physical basis for the whole origination, namely, that physical feeling which is both the indicative, feeling, and the physical recognition. The imagination is tied to one ultimate fact, Section B. Imaginative feelings belong to the general case when the indicative feeling and the physical recognition differ. 402. But there are degrees of difference, which can vary from the case when the two nexus, forming the objective data of the two feelings respectively, enjoy the extreme of remote disconnection, to the case at the other extreme when the two nexus are almost identical. But in so far as there is diversity between the feelings, there is some trace of a free imagination. The proposition which is the objective datum of an imaginative feeling has a predicate derived, with or without reversions, from a nexus which in some respects differs from the nexus providing the logical subjects. Thus the proposition is felt as an imaginative notion concerning its logical subjects. The proposition in its own nature gives no suggestion as to how it should be felt. In one prehending subject it may be the datum of a perceptive feeling, and in another prehending subject it may be the datum of an imaginative feeling. But the subjective forms of the two feelings will differ according to the differences in the histories of the origination of those feelings in their respective subjects. The subjective forms of propositional feelings are dominated by valuation, rather than by consciousness. 
In a pure propositional feeling the logical subjects have preserved their indicated particularity, but have lost their own real modes of objectification. The subjective form lies in the twilight zone between pure physical feeling and the clear consciousness which apprehends the contrast between physical feeling and imagined possibility. A propositional filiug is a lure to creative emergence in the transcendent future. When it is functioning as a lure, the propositional feeling about the logical subjects of the proposition may in some subsequent phase promote decision involving intensification of some physical feeling of those subjects in the nexus. Thus, according to the various categorial conditions, propositions intensify, attenuate, inhibit, or transmute, without necessarily entering into clear consciousness or encountering judgment. The Theory of Prehensions 264 It follows that in the pursuit of truth even physical, 403J feelings must be criticized, since their evidence is not final apart from an analysis of their origination. This conclusion merely confirms what is a commonplace in all scientific investigation, that we can never start from dogmatic certainty. Such certainty is always an ideal to which we approximate as the result of critical analysis. When we have verified that we depend upon an authentic perceptive feeling, whose origination involves no reversions, then we know that the proposition which is the datum of that feeling is true. Thus there can be no immediate guarantee of the truth of a proposition, by reason of the mode of origination of the propositional feeling, apart from a critical scrutiny of that mode of origination. The feeling has to be I-perceptive, E-authentic, and E-direct, where a definite meaning has, in the preceding section, been assigned to each of these conditions. T there is, however, always this limitation to the security of direct knowledge, based on direct physical feeling, namely, that the creative emergence can import into the physical feelings of the actual world pseudo-determinants which arise from the concepts entertained in that actual world, and not from the physical feelings in that world. This possibility of error is peculiarly evident in the case of that special class of physical feelings which belong to the mode of presentational immediacy. The proposition which is the datum of an imaginative feeling may be true. The two questions of the origination of consciousness in the subjective forms of feelings, and of the intuitive judgment of a proposition, apart from the mode of origination of the feeling of it, must now be considered. Section B. Language, as usual, is always ambiguous as to the exact proposition which it indicates. Spoken language is merely a series of squeaks. Its function is 1% to arouse in the prehending subject some physical feeling indicative of the logical subjects of the proposition, F3 to arouse in the prehending subject some physical feeling which plays the part of the physical recognition, Y to promote the sublimation of the physical recognition into the conceptual predicative feeling, 8 to promote the integration of the indicative feeling and the predicative feeling into the required propositional feeling. But in this complex function there is always a tacit reference to 404, the environment of the occasion of utterance. Consider the traditional example, Socrates is mortal. This proposition may mean, it is mortal. In this case the word, Socrates, in the circumstances of its utterance merely promotes a physical feeling indicating the it which is mortal. The proposition may mean, it is Socratic and mortal, where, 
Socratic is an additional element in the predicative pattern. Propositions and feelings. 265 We now turn to the words denoting the predicative pattern, namely, either, mortal, or, Socratic and mortal. The slightest consideration discloses the fact that it is pure convention to suppose that there is only one logical subject to the proposition. Tile word, mortal, means a certain relationship to the general nexus of actual entities in this world which is possible for any one of the actual entities. Mortal, does not mean, mortal in any possible world, it means, mortal in this world. Thus there is a general reference to this actual world as exemplifying a scheme of things which render, mortality, realizable in it. The word, Socratic, means, realizing the Socratic predicate in Athenian society. It does not mean, Socratic, in any possible world, nor does it mean, Socratic, anywhere in this world, it means, Socratic, in Athens. Thus, Socratic, is here used, refers to a society of actual entities realizing certain general systematic properties such that the Socratic predicate is realizable in that environment. Also the Athenian society requires that this actual world exemplifies a certain systematic scheme amid which Athenianism is realizable. Thus in the one meaning of the phrase Socrates is mortal, the logical subjects are one singular at Socrates and the actual entities of this actual world, forming a society amid which mortality is realizable and including the former, it. In the other meaning, there are also included among the logical subjects the actual entities forming the Athenian society. These actual entities are 405 required for the realization of the predicative pattern, Socratic and mortal, and are the definitely indicated logical subjects. They also require that the general scheme of this actual world be such as to support Athenianism in conjunction with mortality. Plus, Chapter Verses The Higher Phases of Experience Section I 406 Comparative Feelings are the result of integrations not yet considered. Their data are generic contrasts. The infinite variety of the more complex feelings come under the heading Comparative Feelings. We have now to examine two simple types of comparative feelings. One type arises from the integration of a propositional feeling with the indicative feeling from which it is partly derived. Feelings of this type will be termed intellectual feelings. This type of comparative feelings is subdivided into two species. One species consists of conscious perceptions and the other species consists of intuitive judgments. The subjective forms of intuitive judgments also involve consciousness. Thus, conscious perceptions and intuitive judgments are like intellectual feelings. Comparative feelings of the other type are termed physical purposes. Such a feeling arises from the integration of a conceptual feeling with the basic physical feeling from which it is derived, either directly according to categorial condition IV, the category of conceptual valuation, or indirectly according to categorial condition V, the category of conceptual reversion. But this integration is a more primitive type of integration than that which produces, from the same basic physical feeling, the species of propositional feelings termed perceptive. 
The subjective forms of these physical purposes are either aversions or aversions. The subjective forms of physical purposes do not involve consciousness unless these feelings acquire integration with conscious perceptions or intuitive judgments. 407. Section 2. In an intellectual feeling the datum is the generic contrast between a nexus of actual entities and a proposition with its logical subjects mem, verse of the nexus. In every generic contrast its unity arises from the two-way functioning of certain entities which are components in each of the contrasted factors. This unity expresses the confirmation to the second categorial condition, the category of objective identity. The common, subject, entertaining the two feelings affects an integration whereby each of these actual entities obtains its one role of a two-way functioning in the one generic contrast. As an element in the subject no objectified actual, 266. The higher phases of experience. 267. Entity can play two disconnected parts. There can only be one analyzable part. Thus what in origination is describable is a pair of distinct ways of functioning of each actual entity in the two factors of the generic contrast respectively is realized in the subject as one role with a two-way aspect. This two-way aspect is unified as contrast. This one analyzable part involves in itself the contrast between the sheer matter of fact namely, what the objectified actual entity in question contributes to the objectified nexus in the physical feeling, and the mere potentiality of the same actual entity for playing its assigned part in the predicative pattern of the proposition, in the eventuality of the proposition's realization. This contrast is what has been termed the affirmation-negation contrast. It is the contrast between the affirmation of objectified fact in the physical feeling, and the mere potentiality, which is the negation of such affirmation, in the propositional feeling. It is the contrast between, in fact, and, might be, in respect to particular instances in this actual world. The subjective form of the feeling of this contrast is consciousness. Thus in experience, consciousness arises by reason of intellectual feelings, and in proportion to the variety and intensity of such feelings. But, in conformity with the 7th 408 Categorial Condition, the category of subjective harmony, subjective forms, which arise as factors in any feeling, are finally in the satisfaction shared in the unity of all feelings, t all feelings acquire their quota of irradiation in consciousness. This account agrees with the plain facts of our conscious experience. Consciousness flickers. And even at its brightest, there is a small focal region of clear illumination, and a large penumbra region of experience which tells of intense experience in dim apprehension. The simplicity of clear consciousness is no measure of the complexity of complete experience. Also this character of our experience suggests that consciousness is the crown of experience, only occasionally attained, not its necessary base. Section 3 A feeling is termed of belief, or is said to include an element of belief, when its datum is a proposition, and its subjective form includes, as the defining element in its emotional pattern, a certain form, or eternal object, associated with some gradation of intensity. This eternal object is, belief character. 
When this character enters into the emotional pattern, then, according to the intensity involved, the feeling, whatever else it be, is to some degree a belief. This variation in the intensity of belief character is insisted on by Locke in his essay. He writes IV, 15, creepy entertainment the mind gives this sort of propositions is called belief, assent, or opinion, which is the admitting or receiving any proposition for true, upon arguments or proofs that are found to persuade us to receive it as true, without certain knowledge that it is so. 268. The Theory of Prehensions and herein lies the difference between probability and certainty, faith and knowledge, that in all that parts of knowledge there is intuition, each immediate idea, each step has its visible and certain connection, in belief not so. 409 Locke's distinction between certainty and uncertain belief is admirable, but it is not nearly so important as it looks. For it is not the immediate intuition that we are usually concerned with. We only have its recollection recorded in words. Whether the verbal record of a recollection recalls to our minds a true proposition must always be a matter of great uncertainty. Accordingly our attitude towards an immediate intuition must be that of the gladiators, moriturite salutimus, as we pass into the limbo where we rely upon the uncertain record. It must be understood that we are not speaking of the objective probability of a proposition, expressing its relation to certain other propositions. Comparative firmness of belief is a psychological fact which may, or may not, be justified by the objective evidence. This belief character takes various forms from its fusion with consciousness derived from the various types of intellectual feelings. Section IV. Conscious perception is the feeling of what is relevant to immediate fact in contrast with its potential irrelevance. This general description must now be explained in detail. Conscious perceptions are of such importance that it is worthwhile to rehearse the whole sequence of their origination. It will be seen that alternative modes of origination are involved, and that some of these modes produce erroneous perceptions. Thus the criticism of conscious perceptions has the same importance as the criticism of judgments, intuitive and inferential. In the first place, there is one basic physical feeling, from which the whole sequence of feelings originates for the subject in question. From this physical feeling, the propositional feeling of the sort term, perceptive, arises. The conscious perception is the comparative feeling arising from the integration of the perceptive feeling with this original physical feeling. 410 in the account of the origination of the perceptive feeling part 3 ch iv sect iv the various species of such feelings are analyzed first into authentic feelings and unauthentic feelings and secondly authentic feelings are analyzed into direct feelings and indirect feelings. Without qualification a direct perceptive feeling feels its logical subjects as potentially invested with a predicate expressing an intrinsic character of the nexus which is the initial datum of the physical feeling, with qualification this statement is also true of an indirect feeling. The qualification is that the secondary conceptual feelings, entertained in the nexus, the higher phases of experience, 269, by reason of reversion cf, 
Pedagorial Condition B have been transmuted so as to be felt in the subject, the final subject of the conscious perception as if they had been physical facts in the nexus. Of course such transmutation of physical feeling only arises when no incompatibilities are involved. Thus, in general, a transmuted physical feeling only arises as the outcome of a complex process of incompatibilities and inhibitions. Apart from exceptional circumstances only to be found in few high-grade organisms, transmutation only accounts for physical feelings of negligible intensity. It is, however, important to note that even authentic physical feelings can distort the character of the nexus felt by transmuting felt concept into felt physical fact. In this way authentic perceptive feelings can introduce error into thought, and transmuted physical feelings can introduce novelty into the physical world. Such novelty may be either fortunate or disastrous. But the point is that novelty in the physical world, and error in authentic perceptive feeling, arise by conceptual functioning, according to the category of reversion. Putting aside the case when these transmuted perceptive feelings have importance, consider the prehending subject with its direct perceptive feeling. The subject has its concrescent phase involving two factors, the rich 411 final physical feeling and the derived perceptive feeling. In the earlier factor the nexus, physically felt, is objectified through its own proper physical bonds. There are no incompatibilities between fact and reverted concept to produce attenuation. The objective datum is therefore felt with its own proper intensities, transmitted to the subjective form of the physical feeling. The other factor in the integration is the perceptive feeling. The datum of this feeling is the proposition with the actual entities of the nexus as its logical subjects, and with its predicate also derived from the nexus. The whole origination of this perceptive feeling has its sole basis in the physical feeling, which plays the part both of indicative feeling and of physical recognition, cf. part 3, ch. iv. sect. 3. The integration of the two factors into the conscious perception thus confronts the nexus as fact, with the potentiality derived from itself, limited to itself, and exemplified in itself. This confrontation is the generic contrast which is the objective datum of the integral feeling. The subjective form thus assumes its vivid immediate consciousness of what the nexus really is in the way of potentiality realized. In Hume's phraseology, there is an impression of the utmost force and vivacity. There are therefore two immediate guarantees of the correctness of a conscious perception. One is Hume's test of force and vivacity, and the other is the illumination by consciousness of the various feelings involved in the process. Thus the fact that the physical feeling has not transmuted concept into physical bonds, lies open for inspection. Neither of these tests is infallible. There is also the delayed test, that the future conforms. 270. The theory of prehensions. Two expectations derived from this assumption. This latter test can be realized only by future occasions in the life of an enduring object, the enduring percipient. It is to be observed that what is in doubt is not the immediate perception of a nexus which is a fragment of 412, the actual world. The dubitable element is the definition of this nexus by the observed predicate. 
An unauthentic perceptive feeling arises in the subject when its own conceptual origination from its own basic physical feeling passed on to the secondary stage of producing a reverted conceptual feeling to play the part of predicated feeling. The physical feeling may, or may not, have also suffered loss of direct